All right, good morning. It is great to see everybody. Welcome back after a great Easter week and weekend. Thanks for joining us online today as well. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. As we start a new series, as we're continuing to go through the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, and um, we're going to start this new series called Laying It Down, looking at the rights that we have, but the rights that Jesus challenges us to lay down in the name of love quite a bit. So a lot about love in the next few weeks and, and how love should be a goal and a driving force. And today we're looking particularly at this concept of, of how we grow in our knowledge, but to what end? What is our knowledge for? So we're going to be, be looking at that um, today. And um, so as we're turning there in First Corinthians today, just a couple of updates. So our Webster Groves campus is meeting today, and uh, they have no power. So that's good fun, right? So they're, thankfully, they're, they're, the worship center has windows, so they're able to see and gather. And so they're just going all acoustic today, probably kind of be kind of fun for them, but uh, our lights are a little bit messed up because of the power, so if you're kind of in a dark zone, sorry, we got to figure out how to reset all that um, it'll, this week, but thanks for your patience there, but looking at knowledge and love, how many of you have ever been around someone and you thought you had a great understanding of something and you said something like you had just learned, to which a person replied something like, well, no, duh. Anybody have that happened to you? Yeah, where you thought you just finally figured out something amazing and smart only to learn and realize everybody seems to know this already. You're just kind of the late one catching up, right? How does that make you feel? Makes you feel a little, I don't know, insignificant or like a little slow to the party, a little dumb, right, whatever. Well, knowledge is a good thing, amen? Knowledge is a good thing. We, we like knowledge, education's important. We should be doing that, but... Sometimes a lot of knowledge with no love leaves you being arrogant and, you know, just kind of conceited. And we don't, I mean, who of us likes to be around and know it all? None of us do. Or someone who just knows they're always right, no matter what. They're always right. You, any of you always think you're right? I know you do. Go ahead. Raise your hand. You're just always right. Yeah, I, I know some of y'all. Right. Blaylock, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, and, and sometimes that's fun. But when you get around someone who's arrogant and just always a know-it-all, that's a problem. Well, that's what Paul's dealing with. And so as we're looking, just kind of going through the book of 1 Corinthians, just to kind of a historical recap. So Paul plants the church in the city of Corinth in, in ancient uh, Greece in about 51 AD. He spends about 18 months there just starting this church and raising up leaders and that sort of thing. And then he leaves to go plant churches elsewhere. Well, just a couple of years later, he gets some letters and correspondence from the church in Corinth. And they're just talking about all the troubles they're having, right? And we've been through a lot. They're divided over which leader they're supposed to follow. And Paul's like, well, you follow Jesus, right? And then we, we, we did a whole series through the sexual problems they were having in their, in their church and in their culture, in the city of Corinth as well. Well, today we're getting to this arrogance problem. And so we're going to be looking at, at chapter 8. There's kind of an obscure issue that comes up that seems foreign to us. We don't really understand. Someone unpacked the Talk what Paul's going to talk about food, sacrifice to idols. That was a big deal. We'll talk about that, what that means. But we want to get to the, to the principles of what does it mean for you and I to grow in knowledge in a humble, submitted way. And that's kind of what we're looking at today. So we're going to read um, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to read all 13 verses. So if you please stand back up and honor the reading of God's word. It'd be a great thing. All right, chapter 8, verse 1. Now consider concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know, or as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom um, are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off 
uh, if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brother and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. All right, let's pray and we'll unpack some of this. God, we love you. God, thank you for just a great day already. God, just uh, we praise you for Dorian and just how you saved him and are just changing his life and doing a great work there. Thank you for saving so many of us and changing a lot of us. God, that day I pray specifically that as we go through this passage, that it talks about knowledge and love and how knowledge should lead us to love. I pray, God, that we would really take this to heart and we would put this into practice on choosing moment by moment to love others more than ourselves, to love you, God, supremely above all, and to let that just change how we live our life, the decisions we make, the attitudes we have. God, this permeates so many different levels of life. So God, be honored in not only what we hear today, but God, how we respond to it. So Jesus, be glorified. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks, go ahead and be seated. And like Nathan said a few minutes ago, you can go ahead and take out your notes and follow along. If you have the app open, you can um, follow along in that as well and take those notes and email them to yourself later. I always encourage taking the notes because we remember uh, so little of what we hear, but that's amplified if we write things down as we go. So the big thought this morning is talk about the importance of knowledge. I mean, knowledge is important. Never want to belittle the importance of knowledge. It's critical. However, it is not the end goal, right? Your goal of being a follower of Jesus is not just to know a lot about Jesus, not just to know a lot about the Bible, right? That's good. That's critical. But that's not the end game, right? That's, that's a means to an end. Knowledge is the means to the end of love, loving God and loving others. So ideally, right, the more you grow in Christ, the more you understand scriptures, the more you understand who Jesus is, what Jesus taught, how Jesus lived, why Jesus did the things he did, the more we know those things, it should impact that we should be loving more, not be more arrogant and puffed up. But a lot of times it seems to have that effect, right? Um, I remember when I was in, a teenager in, in the youth group, <clears throat> not here at a little church in, in Tennessee, we had this one guy. This guy was named Alan. Well, I'm sure that's still his name, right? <clears throat> he didn't change his name, but anyway, Alan. So Alan was a really smart guy. I mean, he was brilliant, very intellectual, you know, and um, he somehow, he just knew at the age of like 16, he just knew a lot about the Bible. Right? And I remember being in the class and, you know, every time the teacher would ask a question, Alan would be, ooh, ooh, you know, he would know the answer, which is good. But when someone else in the class answered and gave the wrong answer, Alan would have that attitude like, good grief, don't you know anything? The answer is this. And so you think Alan had many friends in the youth group? He didn't. No, people resented him because of his arrogance, his intellectual arrogance. And that, and that intellectualism, right, the knowledge he was growing in should have been leading him to love, but it wasn't. It was leading him to pride. And that is so disastrous. So this is what Paul here is, is talking about. And how first, number one in your notes is knowledge can be a source of arrogance. It can be a source of arrogance. So here in, in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1, this is really fitting for our time together, right? Because it addresses people who they exist in Christianity, they exist in churches, right? That technically have the right knowledge, which is important, but act wrongly because of a lack of love, right? If you carry your biblical knowledge with arrogance, you're going to end up doing more damage to the body of Christ than you are building up. And as we're going to see today, the end game of love is to build others up. And so that's where we're kind of going with all. So um, the first thing, letter A in your notes, is knowledge-based arrogance is revealed by attitude. So here in verse 1, Paul turns your attention to this topic of food offered to idols. We're going to unpack that here in a little bit. But he says, here's his quote. And this um, ESV has this in quotes. I believe that's appropriate. 
where it says, we know that, quote, all of us possess knowledge, quote. And then this, quote, knowledge, quote, puffs up. So here, Paul is doing it yet again, taking a quote that's pretty common among the Corinthian people, the Corinthian church, and going to kind of use that argument or use that quote against them. So he says, look, a lot of you are saying, hey, we all have this knowledge. Well, no, you don't, right? That's, that's kind of the point. Of it. No, not everybody has this knowledge. But he's approaching this attitude that they have in this quote that they, that they use. So again, Paul is not against us having knowledge. He's not saying don't think or don't think hard. No, we should do these things. We should ponder. We should, we should delve into these really hard topics to, to think through and process, right? Um, but he's, he's saying, you know what? We, we, not everybody knows. Not everybody has this knowledge. And there's attitude behind that. Um, He's like, look, a lot of us know that there's no such thing as gods behind these idols. Yeah, they're just, they're just physical statues. But it's not all about you. It's cold and it's stale. And it's all about you having the knowledge instead of you loving your brother. Verses four through six, he says, as to the exi- eating of food offered to idols, yeah, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there's no God but one. He goes and he, and he unpacks these things. So Paul's saying, yeah, an idol doesn't have any real existence. We know that. You're right. But, verse seven, he says, however, not all possess this knowledge. Some through former associations, through previous, prior to coming to Christ, they practiced this. It was real for them, even though it wasn't real in absolute sense. Their perspective was it was real. And so you're not treating them with love. So only some of the Corinthian believers had this knowledge. Others didn't. And then he brings this, this, this language of stronger and weaker. He says the stronger, more knowledgeable believers need to be mindful of where their weaker brothers are and not have this attitude toward them. Oh, yeah, we all know that. In other words, yeah. No, duh. Don't have that attitude behind your knowledge. It's not like a, if you ever played basketball, you ever played basketball before, like competitively or just for fun? It's like when you're playing basketball, but you get that one guy that, that he's, he's is, and, you know, he's really good, but he never passes the ball to anyone. He's not a team player. It's all about him or, or her, right? You know, they don't pass, they don't share, they don't, there's no assist. They just take the ball, dribble, and all by themselves try to score. And they may score a bunch of baskets. But what they're doing is they're really crippling the team. It might be good for that person, but it's not good for the whole team. And so that's kind of what's happening, right, in, 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 in this church situation that Paul's talking about. Yeah, you, you might be right, you might know a lot, you might have a lot of biblical knowledge. You might be the Bible answer guy or the Bible answer gal. But if you have that attitude, you're going to be doing more damage than you are building up. Just the, the way it is. It's like Paul saying this. You might be brilliant, but you're killing the team. You're not building up brothers. You're making them feel dumb and wounding their conscience. You're not stirring them up to love and good deeds. You just keep making them feel inadequate. By your knowledge, the weaker brothers being destroyed. Just think about that. You know, a lot of you are, are teachers, have been teachers, will be teachers in small groups, et cetera. How are you leveraging your knowledge, right? And how do you reveal your answers? If you're participating in your small group discussions, are you coming off trying to, are you trying to make yourself look smart, let others look not so smart, like you're more advanced? Are you, are you understanding the stronger, weaker concepts? So, but I do want to hit, make sure you know, knowledge is essential, right? And Paul hits this. Yes, it's important. You know, you can't do the right things unless you first believe the right things, right? So we get that. And Paul says, like in Romans chapter 10, he goes through how important knowledge is. He says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That true? Amen, that's true. That's the knowledge. You can't, you can't call on the name of the Lord unless you first know you're supposed to call on the name of the Lord, right? And Paul further unpacks this. He says, how, so he unpacks this, this uh, logical thought. How then will they call on him in whom they haven't believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they haven't heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? So knowledge is critical. Knowledge is so important. And so here, the issue Paul's addressing is his whole meat 
offered to idols. We say, what is that talking about? Well, the Corinthian people, a lot of them had come out of pagan backgrounds. They once had worshipped idols, statues. It might have been statues of like Zeus or Artemis or other, other Greek gods or goddesses of the Greek pantheon, right? And they believed that meat was inhabited by demons. So they would offer the meat before their idol. And the idea was that the idol, as they prayed to their idol and offered this meat to the idol, that the idol would cleanse the meat of the demons. So when they consumed the meat, it would be clean and inhabited by their God instead of by the demons. And so it was an act of worship to their idol as they presented the meat for their idol to bless, to cast out the demon in the meat, fill the demon with him or herself, and then they were, it was kind of blessed. So it was an act of worship of the people towards the idol. And they'd grown up doing this all of their life. It was their way. It was their culture. And so some of them were still affected, even though, yeah, maybe, maybe mentally they knew, okay, this, is real, this wasn't real. There really is no such god or goddesses like Artemis or Zeus or Diana. They're just, they're fake. But gosh, I still feel guilty, even though I know it's okay to do that. Have any of you ever been like that where you felt guilty about doing something even though you kind of knew it was okay? You know, like, like someone, someone who you know was not, did not have a lot of means, they wanted to bless you and they gave you a gift card somewhere and you kind of felt guilty taking it because you know they really needed it more than you do. But at the same time, this is an act of love for them to give this to you. You know what I'm talking about, right? So there's, we have those, those situations sometimes where in an absolute vacuum, it's fine to do something. It's our right. But does it mean it's the right thing to do, right? So, so that's what these people were struggling with. Even though it was okay for them to eat this food, this meat sacrificed to idols now, because now they've learned that was all fake, they're still in their conscience. There's still this, this check, this yellow light, or even red light says, I can't really do this, because in my mind, that's still me worshiping that idol. I don't worship that idol anymore. I worship Jesus. And so for them, it was a big stumbling block. So, but these, some of these, but these other Corinthian believers who were right in their thinking would say, oh, they're not real. Just go ahead and eat. It's no big deal. But it was a big deal for them. And that's where they failed to acknowledge the love and the, the, the weakness that the other brother or sister had. So let's keep unpacking this. So knowledge is essential. But knowledge should be a source of love. Number two in your notes. And so we see for letter A here that knowledge is essential, but it's not sufficient. It's not enough. Hmm. So again, the knowledgeable Christian is saying, just eat it. So listening to this informed but unloving counsel, the consciences of the less knowledgeable were being wounded. So Paul addresses this. He says, yeah, you're right. The idols are not really gods, but that's not the point. The point is that in using your knowledge, you weren't thinking about your brother. He didn't yet feel right in his conscience about taking the meat, and yet you unlovingly pushed him toward it because of your knowledge. You wounded his conscience. Why would you do that? Why in the world would you do that and hurt your brother or sister in Christ? Knowledge is essential but it's not sufficient. It takes knowledge about this for me to preach it, but there's more to it. There's gotta be loved involved. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 13. Same guy, Paul, same guy that's writing 1 Corinthians, writes this, says, and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and have all knowledge, but then what? If I have not love, I am what? Say that again, if I have not love, I am Nothing. Knowledge is critical, but it's not sufficient. It doesn't matter if I have all the knowledge in the world. It's important. It's essential. I need to think hard. I need to understand. I need to dig into theology and what scripture teaches. But if I then exercise that without love, I could be brilliant and be worthless at the same time. That's what he's talking about. Because, let her be, genuine knowledge of Jesus leads us to compassion. That's the point Paul is is driving home. We see this from Jesus. 
Jesus says in John 14, 12, how we're supposed to be like him and he's gonna empower us to be like him. So the more we know Jesus, the more Christ-like we're gonna be, right? He says, truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Now, was Jesus compassionate? Come on, was Jesus compassionate? Absolutely. That's why he went to the cross for you and for me. We see just historical event after historical event in scriptures where Jesus acts compassionately, where he does things that most people in his shoes wouldn't do. Like he goes out of his way to meet a Samaritan woman. He crosses social boundaries, racial boundaries there that, you know, you just weren't supposed to cross in those days. He did out of love and compassion. You know, he healed people out of love and compassion. Did they deserve to be healed? No, none of us deserve the grace of God, but that's what's called grace, unmerited favor. That's compassion. So he tells them that, and he tells it for us. In 2 Corinthians 5, the love of Christ controls us. Some translations say the love of Christ should compel us because we have concluded this. Here's compassion, that one has died for all. That's Jesus' compassion. Therefore, all have died, and he died for all, so that now those of us who live might no longer live for ourselves, but live for who? For him, for their sake who died and was raised, for our sake. So, love should be, I mean, knowledge should be that source of love, and then love's end is to build others up. So your brilliance is worthless if you're not building up your brother. So why do you, those of you teach, why do you get into teaching God's word? Is it not to build others up, to help them understand scriptures? It's, that's the goal, that's, that should be the heart behind it. If your heart behind his teaching is to make others be, wow, this guy's smart, then your goal, your heart is misplaced. That's pride and arrogance, right? Our goal should be, anyway, how we serve, how we teach, how we explain, all of that should be oriented on building others up. That's the goal. That's what the church is supposed to be all about. Paul says in Ephesians chapter four, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for what? Building up, as it fits the occasion. So it may give grace to those who hear. Just notice Paul's heart here. Look, look what he says here in verse 13. If food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat. Let's just stop right there. I love meat. Could I really say that? Man, I'd I'd struggle with that, honestly, you know. Never eat meat. Would I become a vegetarian if me eating meat caused my brothers and sisters to stumble? I had to wrestle that this week because, I mean, those that know me, I... Those, the kitchen crew knows every time I go through the line, they say, hey, would you want some veggies? Nope. <laughs> no, thanks. Just more meat, please. You know, that's just the way I roll. You know, I'm a meat eater. I'm a carnivore. And, um, but man, for me to give up my meat, that's, that stretched me this week. I, I don't know if I love, I'm not, I may, I may not be there yet. I need more sanctification. I need Jesus to do deeper work in my life. Now, thankfully, I don't believe he's right now calling me to be a vegetarian. <laughs> So hallelujah for grace, but man, this is Paul's heart, you know? Paul is like, look, if it means not to cause my brother to stumble for me to give up meat, I am giving up meat. I'll eat nothing but broccoli and beans and all that nastiness, <laughs> right? <laughs> for my brother. That's, that's the goal, though, that love leads to building up. Love is not, it's, it's where it's not about me. And I know we, we say this a lot in here, but just go ahead and do it again. Just look at your neighbor and say, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's all about the Lord. It's all about serving God and therefore serving others. So Paul says, verse 11, he says, if so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ has died, right? You're really sinning against Christ, this is, this is a big deal. Here's what I want you to hear today, right? Is when you cause a brother or sister in Christ to stumble in their walk, that is a big deal. It's not casual. It's not, oh, they need to grow up. That's their problem. No, it is your problem, according to scripture right here, right? Uh, each other, 
It's all the each others of the Bible. We, we've done a whole series on the each others, 37 each others in the Bible. We matter. Each other matters to each other, right? The body of Christ, we're family. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. You're going to be brothers and sisters in Christ forever. These are eternal relationships, which is awesome. We got to be on the lookout for each other, to encourage each other, help build each other up now. Now, building up each other is not always just about encouragement and positive. Sometimes there's those hard conversations. Sometimes, hey, I love you, but man, what are you doing? You know, you, you, you all not be doing this. Let me, let me walk with you through this. Instead of throwing stones and telling them they're failures, we, we lock arms together. Hey, let me walk you through this tough time. Or when a brother or sister's had a tragedy happen in their life. You know, I've seen this church be great at that, at just walking with each other through really difficult seasons. Whether it's death of a loved one or whether it's, you know, like cancer, whether it's relationship woes, financial woes. It's been great to see a lot of you just lock arms and walk with each other together, praying for each other. That's huge. That's what we're supposed to be doing. It's about building each other up because that's what love does. Love builds each other up. Well, there's a similar passage in Romans. Again, written by the same guy, Paul. He says, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. I mean, just, just look around the room. It's kind of a cool thought, right? Do you know that God is working in every single person's life right here? Every, everyone's in here. God is working in your life. A lot of times we don't recognize it. We don't see it, perceive it. A lot of you, maybe you're, you're here and you're, you're not even sure you're a follower of Jesus. You're, you're kind of like, well, what is all this Christianity stuff, right? Whether you recognize or not, God is working in your life, right? Or if you've been following Jesus for 50 years, God is still working in your life. But you look around and understand that God's working in every single one of our lives, but we're all at different places, different stages, different seasons of our walk with Jesus. Some of you might be thinking like, well, you know, man, when I was was in my 20s, I was so close to Jesus. Now I just feel like I'm just kind of in a rut, just kind of going through the motions. And you know that in your life, you really need a revival, kind of a a reawakening to the goodness, the joy, the beauty of walking with Jesus. If some of you, like I said, are kind of new to this, you're not even sure what all this means. But like, man, I really, really want to know about the possibility of knowing God in a relationship. That just sounds amazing. And to those who have it, it is amazing, right? Absolutely. Others may be like, man, I'm just, I've really blown it. I mean, I had such a good walk with Jesus at once upon a time, but I've just blown it. I feel like I'm just miles away from God. And, and you, you may really be, although God hasn't moved, you've moved, right? God never changes. God is immovable. But we do. We get caught up in our life and get caught up in our sin. We get caught up in our just different ideologies and we just drift, right? It's a, it's a, it's a natural thing in our, in our fallen nature to drift away from God. That's why things like daily Bible reading, the gathering that we have every week is so important because it just keeps us focused. That's why Hebrews 10 says, do not forsake the assembling together of the saints as some are accustomed. Because in this, we stir up love and good works. We keep each other focused on the Lord and on scripture. That's why that's so important. It keeps us focused on love. He goes on here. So don't, just keep in mind, God is working in all of our lives. What Paul is saying here, for the sake of food, don't destroy how God's working in someone else's life. Everything is indeed clean, but it's wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or not to drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Said he goes on, the faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves, meaning that your conscience is clear. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats. Because the eating is not from faith, or whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. He goes on in verse 15. So who are strong, you have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, not to please yourselves. In other words, let me translate that, right? We are to lay our rights down. Do we have the right to eat meat? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. If you go over to some friend's house, and let's say you're, you're you're becoming good friends with some some Muslim neighbors, 
And you know, their tradition, their religion tells them that they're not to eat pork. And so you go to their house and they don't have any food that, any meat that you like on the table. You just eat and be joyful. You don't cause them to stumble, right? That's loving the neighbor. Within, you know, Christianity, this was still the deal in the, in the New Testament time was this whole thing about the, the meat there. So don't cause a brother to stumble. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Of course, Jesus is our best example of this, of laying down personal rights for the sake of loving someone else. No one, none of us has done anything remotely close to what Jesus did for us. Just think about it. He gave up, he gave up his glorious existence in heaven in order to come here to live a primitive life only with the basic necessities, which that life would end in great humiliation, pain, and suffering. And he did it for us out of love, out of compassion. And every one of us, we deserve what was done to him, but he took it for us. Hmm. So, this seems like a good starting point for us. Verse two tells us to please others, but it also clearly states that pleasing others is for that specific purpose of building them up. This, this term, building them up in the, under, in the Greek language, sometimes it's translated edification, but it has the concept of building a structure. You build a house one brick at a time. You're building a structure. So you're not, you're not just doing it because you just want them to feel good. No, we're, it's a more strategic thing. We're building each other up into the glorious body of Christ. So as we, as we close, just wanna offer five reasons to surrender your rights to God and others. Five reasons. Just to contemplate this. Now this goes against modern thinking, right? We don't, we don't surrender, we wanna win, right? Anybody competitive here? Come on, I'm uber competitive. If you play board games with me, you know this. If you play ball with me, you know that I'm uber competitive. I hate, loathe to lose, right? So this, this truth goes against my grain, but this is a Jesus quality, humility. And what we saw with Jesus, he surrendered at the cross, but in his surrender, his ultimate victory, right? It's kind of a paradox. We surrender to win. So here's what... Number one, the first reason to surrender to God and others. Surrender reveals that Jesus is truly Lord, right? Surrendering to Jesus, submitting yourself to Jesus. We see in Romans chapter chapter 10, verse nine and 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and that's not an empty title, that means you you are bowing to King Jesus, right? You are submitting yourself to Jesus, it's an act of your will, it's an act of your disposition. I am submitting my life to Christ and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And it goes on and finishes, it's with the heart one believes and is justified, but it's with the mouth that confession is made and one is saved. That's truth, that's truth, amen? Surrendering to Jesus is what salvation is all about. It's what Dorian did. It's what many of us have done. We have submitted our life to Jesus. And in that lies salvation because we believe God really did raise him from the dead. If you believe in Easter and you surrender to Jesus, you're saved. Amen? That's awesome. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Number two, a person who regularly surrenders their rights for God and others demonstrates humility. If we see all through the Bible, if there's anything that God teaches, if Jesus teaches a Sermon on the Mount, it's all about humility. Pride goes before a fall. Yep. Jesus teaches us, poor, uh, blessed is those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Meek does not equal weak. Humble does not equal weak. Meek and humble means strength under control. That's what it means. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who are persecuted, right? It's all about the humble, right? Old Testament says a, a broken and contrite spirit God has yet to deny. First Peter, Peter says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up, right? Humble. And as we surrender, it just shows humility. When you defer to someone else, when you humble yourself and serve someone else, 
That's a Jesus thing. In fact, remember, Jesus had his disciples and they were traveled. They had all these conversations. You know, one, one scene, they're traveling and you had the brothers, James and John, and they're having an argument. I think all of the disciples were kind of in on the argument, right? And the argument was, who's gonna be, which one of us is gonna be the greatest? That competitive thing, right? Who's gonna be, who's gonna be the best? Who, which of us is gonna be the best disciple, right? And Jesus kind of hears what they're talking about. You know, just always wonder what goes through Jesus' mind. I'm sure he's probably going, good grief, you know. But he's walking along and he tells him, he says, if anyone wanted to be great, he must be a servant. And if you want to be the greatest of all, he must become the servant of all. And I'm sure they're going, what? That doesn't fit in my mind what greatness is. But then Jesus says in Mark chapter 10, even I, the son of man, did not come to be served, but to serve and to offer my life as a ransom for many. That's the Jesus way. Paul tells us in Philippians, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only for your own interest, but also the interest of others. That's humility. Number three, regular surrender reveals God's agenda. Surrender is the antithesis, the opposite of control. Now I know we got some control freaks in here. I are one. But the more we're focused on what God wants to do, what God wants to accomplish, the more we want to let him have control and do do better things in and through our lives. When we let go of areas of our lives that are difficult, it makes room for God to speak to our hearts and do things in us and through us that we can't do as long as we're holding on to that control. Control tries to manipulate our life circumstances to create a more favorable environment or more favorable outcome possible. But God can use those who turn their life over to him much more than he does. He can use those who hold, have closed hands holding on. And Jesus says, this principle in John 15 says, greater love has no one than this. And someone lay down his life for his friends. Number four, surrender always allows us to adapt to changing circumstances allows us to adapt to changing circumstances. If this pandemic taught us anything, right, it's that things can change in an instant, right? And that we're not in control. What is normal one day can have a brand new normal the next day. Perhaps this is why the scriptures assure us not to worry like Jesus teaches in Matthew 6, says, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you eat or drink, about your body. What you'll wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. Do they not sow or reap or store away in barns? Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you by worrying at a single hour to your life? He kind of concludes, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these things will be given to you as well. And then lastly, A surrendered heart increases our faith. Jesus called the 12 to join him on his journey. They're all different backgrounds, even some different languages, heritages, different places in society. However, he knew they would drop everything in their lives to follow him. Many of them lost their comforts to embrace this new chapter of their lives. They lost their careers. As leaders, we will always be asked to sacrifice for the good of those we are leading. As a follower of Jesus, you'll be asked to sacrifice for the good of those you're wanting to influence and encourage with the gospel. When we surrender, our faith increases because we must trust God to lead our lives instead of ourselves. Jesus says it like this. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. What does that mean? It means if you're trying to control, trying to manipulate, trying to make things happen on your own, and you're not surrendering to the Lord, you're not surrendering to the needs of others to serve them, you're gonna lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake. Whoever says, all right, God, I'm I'm letting go. I'm, I'm giving my life to you, Jesus. I wanna follow you. 
whatever that means, wherever, wherever you take me, wherever you tell me to do, whoever you want me to serve, that's where you save it. One pastor one time said it like this. In following Jesus, you really find your life as you give it away. That's kind of interesting. You really find your life as you give it away. So what does that mean for you? Well, if you've never met Jesus, if you never trusted in Jesus, lose your life to him. And trust Jesus with your life. Instead of you trying to figure it all out on your own, instead of you trying to make your own things happen, surrender your life to Christ. Confess, Jesus, you are Lord. I submit my life to you. Because I believe in Easter. I believe, Jesus, you came out of that tomb alive. I want to follow you. In your marriages, maybe your marriage is struggling and maybe you're holding on to your rights as a husband or your rights as the wife and how he or she's wronged you over and over again. And the whole concept of serving each other has become a foreign thing. What does it look like if you led the way by starting to serve your spouse again? Start to put her needs or his needs above yours. Instead of demanding that your expectations and needs are met, you start trying to meet his or her needs and expectations. It'll change things. Love serves. Love builds up. Love does not seek its own. Love seeks God and others. It's not easy. In fact, it's impossible. That's why we must have God in us to do it. So where are you at in all this? Are you laying down rights to build others up? That's a Jesus thing. And you gotta have Jesus in you to do it. Let's all stand. We're gonna pray together. Go to a time of response. If I can get our prayer counselors, come on down. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for modeling this really tough truth for us. God, it's a truth that goes against our nature because in our fallen nature, we want to please and satisfy ourselves. We want to consume. We want to use. We want to have fun. We want to enjoy. God, we want to make it all about us, all about me. And Lord, that's the opposite of the life you've called us to lead. Jesus, that's the opposite of the life that you yourself led and emulated for us. Your life was all about honoring and serving the Father and serving us so that we can know you, so that we could be saved, so we could have forgiveness of our sins, so we could have everlasting life, so we could have a a purpose and meaning in this life. So God, I just know that everyone in this room and watching online, we're all in different places. God, what is it that we are holding on to that's really hindering us from being the, the man or the woman you created us to be, to love and build up. God, what are, we, what are we not surrendering to you? What are we trying to change on our own? What are we holding on to that's, that's being a stumbling block to ourselves or to others? It could be an addiction, it could be a sinful pattern, it could be an attitude, it could be a thought process, it could be a lack of belief. So God, whatever it is, just pray that you use this time just to meet with us and in your love and kindness, just move us to that next step of asking forgiveness, of changing our perspective, God, of taking on the heart of a servant. So God, we just want to give this time to you. Pray use it for your glory in Christ's name.